Everyone, good afternoon. We're going to get started. Let me step back a little bit. Uh, we know we have some people that are still making it from the lunch. We know that. Uh, they'll come in, and that's fine, but we don't want to delay the workshop, so we're going to get started. Everybody is already with us online, and we're ready to go. Uh, welcome to Innovate with Monaco, Innovate with the European Commission, Innovate in Research. We have a wonderful array of speakers, and let's get this kicked off. So a little bit, once again, about the, the program. Some people are just joining us, so I'll just highlight a couple of things. First is you. We're 150 projects here. We're about a billion euro of research. We're about 500 participants, 200 here and about 300 online. We'll get the numbers later finalized, but it is a celebration of you coming together and talking and sharing results and projects, and thank you for being a part of the event. Uh, the program, I would highlight that uh, this is accessible to everyone. You can see the layout of the week. Today and yesterday, we're here. Tomorrow, we shift locations, so please do take note of that. We just had the wonderful lunch, and tonight we're at a signature building here in Nice for the dinner, the Negresco, and we, we look forward to that. Uh, wow. Okay. A walk tomorrow evening for those that would like, and then a visit to uh, the Innovation Center on Friday by reservation. Uh, we have a waiting list for that. It's on standby. So if you're interested, it, it's currently fully booked, but if some people drop out, we can include them. Yesterday, we got the comment, hey, we don't know R2M. Why is there no one saying anything about R2M? So I'll do that for one minute. Research to market, it's right in the name You'll see a lot of the faces here because it takes a lot of us to staff the event. It's a wonderful team. I, I really thank them for the work they've done. Our company does three things principally. We participate in European research. We do sustainability consulting on the market. And between those, we try to take exciting results from research and push them through commercialization onto the market. And we find that a good way to do this is talking about sustainability goals and helping real estate stakeholders map how they can take actions to meet sustainability targets. In simple terms, if I had to give some examples, I would say we digitalize buildings, we put them into BIM environments, we put those into construction management workflows, we do simulations so that we can provide strategy on decarbonization strategies or renewable energy communities or energy efficiency interventions, and then we use great technologies to suggest to those decision makers, such as Joy of Enti Due. The black you see is Onyx Solar, photovoltaic glass. It produces about a megawatt. We met them in a project called PV Sites, which has been presented here in the past. And today we'll hear about Brainbox, implementing artificial intelligence in single and clusters of buildings and on the fleet scale. So these are some snapshots. Let me shift away from R2M. Let me shift on to sustainable places. We have a wonderful history and we've had wonderful locations and we've had wonderful hosts. And this year is no exception. Last year, as we closed Sustainable Places 2021 in Rome, we closed it with a challenge, let's go. And since then, we've been going in some directions that are concerning. I mean, the, the last year has not been a lot of great news. Uh, heat waves, the floods, the picture is a protest happening about energy prices and concerns about the winter, winter and energy poverty. Gazprom is, uh, has shut off gas and threatens to bring an ice age on Europe for the winter. But we, and this is just a message I feel in one way obligated to make, we receive public money from the European Commission. The European Commission has a posture, stand with Ukraine, and this winter, as we work on sustainability topics, I feel it's ever more urgent to get technologies and renewables into action on the buildings. So it, for, it could be no more of a pressing time to work in this field, but it feels like we're so far behind because of the climate and because of world circumstances. So probably this winter, we're gonna have to put on an extra sweater. And if that's what's asked of me as an individual, I'm ready for that. It's fine for me. And, uh, in some way, it's rewarding to know that we contribute to, to these goals. 
So now I'll shift off of sustainable places. I'll shift off the politics, if you will. And I'll shift onto the session, Innovate with Monaco. And uh, we have a wonderful session. Uh, these are the speakers. We'll introduce them one by one in, in a moment. And the theme of this session is Monaco. They just signed an, uh, an agreement with the European Commission. Now they can participate in European research, just like the rest of us, like Switzerland. So the money will come from Monaco. It, it won't come from the European Commission, but they can be partners in projects. So we also have two uh, Monaco-based companies that will present uh, their sustainability, how they fit into the sustainability picture. We also had a pitch yesterday from a Monaco company. So we have this, this teaming of Monaco and Nice, and that's not new, but it's nice to bring it into this event. And then we have two exciting technologies that work on the urban scale. So if you look at a picture of Monaco and you think of Monaco, what an urban area and what an opportunity to do uh, energy transition. So here are two companies with some cutting edge, leading unicorn technologies on the global scale, digital twins and artificial intelligence that are also already partnering with Monaco in European research submissions. So let's hear about what they're doing. Uh, so those are the themes that are present in this session. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Oliver, uh, Olivier Wenden, Vice President and the CEO of the Pris Albert II of Monaco Foundation to talk to us about the foundation and the posture of, of Monaco in the energy transition. Olivier. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you to all of you for having made, made the effort of coming back from the beach despite the heat wave. I'm trying to move forward. Is it better? Seems like it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I am extremely delighted to join you today on this session and to be able to speak on certain issues that are dear to me and I'm sure are dear to you. Environmental protection to start with, innovation, and also beautiful Monaco, the famous members of Nice. Since innovation is the central focus of our discussions today, I would like to start with what I believe makes such innovation possible. And to innovate, I believe we need the coincidence of three main elements. First of all, a need. Because without a need, um, innovation will simply be a game of wits with no consequence on our lives. True innovation, therefore, responds to absolute necessity it serves to resolve crisis and leads to substantial progress. What is then needed is a mix of ambition and determination without which the risk and efforts involved would not be taken. And finally, we of course need resources, whether they are human, economic, financial, political, or productive. And to achieve significant innovation, we need to mobilize tools, resources, and talents alone capable of bringing about the intellectual, political, and technological breakthrough needed to change the world. I don't touch it anymore. It's just the Larsen, huh? Better? Closer and louder, okay? <laughs> Tell me if it becomes painful. So an analysis of these three elements, I believe, enables us to understand the special link that exists between the Principality of Monaco and innovation. Because in Monaco, a combination of these three phenomena exist. First of all, the need. As you may know, Monaco is the second smallest country in the world after Vatican. It's not even two kilometers square. But more importantly, it's a very narrow strip of land wedged between the sea and the mountains. And in Monaco, the sea is omnipresent. It, uh, and it is also a country which lost 80%, 80% of its territory in the 19th century and had to therefore reinvent its whole economy. Therefore, as we see it, innovation addresses two fundamental needs. Firstly, to live in harmony with the sea in Monaco and secondly, to create growth which is neither dependent on the size of the country nor on its energy resources nor on its demography. So the second element I mentioned is the ambition and the vision. And in Monaco, this is clearly the vision of our princes, of course, who for over uh, one and a half centuries made innovation and a different, more responsible relationship with nature, the pillars of the Monaco identity. 
So I will not here give you a lesson of our history, um, but let me quickly mention Prince Charles III, who invented Monte Carlo and SBM, so who created this new type of luxury holiday destination in the mid-19th century. Let me also quote Prince Albert I, who died 100 years ago, who is considered as the father of oceanography worldwide. Closer to us, Prince Rainier III, who married Grace Kelly, but who also made Monaco a global destination, whilst intensifying our commitment to promote environmental um, uh, background, especially in marine environment. And last but not least, Prince Albert II, the current sovereign of Monaco, who has placed his reign under the double banner of environmental protection and innovation. So first of all, environment, to which he's committed on a daily basis through the communion of his government, but also his personal commitment in, on international forums, but also with his foundation that he launched in 2006, and which I am honored to be vice president. Innovation now is also one of the core priorities of his government by means of proactive policy to promote the digital transition, which is now one of the main growth drivers of our small economy. Finally, the third key driver of, of innovation, resources. And here again, the specificities of our small principality play a major role. A stable political regime, a tightly knitted administration, a united and cohesive civil society, as well as substantial financial resources, enabling us to move forward with agility. And this agility can be seen in regard to the digital transition that I quoted. I do not think that many countries in the world would have been capable of making so many resources available in such a little time to make such an important progress. Let me explain myself. Back in 2018, Prince Albert created and launched Extending Monaco, which is a reflection of this agility. And progress was made very fast. We switched the entire country in a couple of months to 5G throughout Monaco. There was the rollout of coding classes for all school children, from kindergarten to the high school. The laws adopted now to allow ICOs um, in Monaco, the implementation of a sovereign cloud based in Monaco, paperless administration as well, or the development of the Monaco Tech Incubator with Xavier Niel and Monaco Telecom. So just in a few years, we brought about rapid change in order to make Monaco a key player in this new world. And this was made possible thanks to the size of our administration, of course, but also the mobilization capacity of the various players involved, who advanced together in a concerted manner for many fronts. And the same applies to the issue in which I am more directly involved, environmental protection. In this field as well, Monaco's very specific features help us to progress with particular agility and, I hope, efficiency. This is due to, first and foremost, to the diversity and complementarity of the implementation methods we are capable of mobilizing. These may be of a scientific nature, and you probably all have heard about the Scientific Center of Monaco, about the Oceanographic Museum or Institute, and other institutions, including the International Atomic Energy Agencies for Marine Environment. Uh, the laboratories are uh, as well established in Monaco, indeed. But this commitment is also of political nature, of course, primarily through, through the voice of Prince Albert on multilateral events or bilateral meetings with uh, heads of state or heads of governments. They are, of course, of diplomatic nature as well, with the strong network of diplomats largely involved on international negotiations related to the environment. And this ambition is also about economic. Thanks to the commitment of many Monegas companies, and I'm glad that today we are um, we are with two of uh, the major ones of the Principality. It's also a commitment of financial nature by the, the innovative tools we implement for major cross-cutting projects. But beyond the diversity of these channels, our strength lies in the way they are structured. This structuring is made possible once again by the proximity and cohesion of these players, these key players, and by the ability 
of the Prince of Monaco Foundation to harness these voices levels for action around common goals. Too often, indeed, innovation comes up against silo-type organizations in which everyone struggles to broaden their horizons. And in contrast, the foundation engages the constructive interaction which enables us to come up with groundbreaking solutions altogether. Three examples. We launched in 2016 with the government of Monaco, the government of France, and the government of Tunisia, a trust fund for the Mediterranean region to develop and strengthen marine protected areas, North Bank and South Bank of the Met. It was worth needed. And through the political commitment of these states, up to today, we have eight mar new marine protected areas protected in the Med with the hope to support 20 by the end of 20, uh, 2029. We also came up with this idea to address plastic pollution, but we all know that the majority of the projects today are all about cleanups, which we are very skeptical of, of, I'm afraid, because the technology doesn't exist today to clean up the vast mess we cause in the ocean. We are not able to clean up the nanoparticles of plastic that are everywhere in the ocean. And even so, if we manage to have that technology, what would this mean? coming back every week, clean up again and again and again. So we decided to launch BMED, Beyond Plastic Med, to fight the plastic pollution on land. So the origin, the source of the problem. And I would quote there, of course, we, we have um, these micro projects funded on the ground to fund hundreds of them, put baskets on the, on the beaches, involve restaurants and cafes. That is working, that's fine, that's bottom to top approach. But the key element in this uh, initiative is to embark companies to embark the private sector through uh, a business club joined by Chanel, Carrefour, Intercontinental. The concept of this private club is really to share the good practices and try to make the change happen within the company and therefore later on to embark the suppliers and the customers. So with Chanel, the, the interesting part is to try to remove the nanoparticles from cosmetics. With Carrefour is to see how such an industry, the agro industry, the agro business, can remove single plastic bag or single plastic use within the company. And we have some successes, and uh, we must pursue in other seas this kind of uh, development. I would also quote the Global Fund for Coral Reef because this is about blended finance. So when we talk about innovation, it doesn't have necessarily to be technology. It can also be in the way we address the problem. So the Global Fund is dedicated to coral reef, as its name says, but we embark blended finance. So traditional philanthropy, but also proper investments. And this, uh, this fund has been developed in two years. It has reached today 132 million US dollars, embarking the United Nations Multi-Partner Trust Fund Office, but also BNP Paribas, Pegasus US-based fund, and many other European states. The last example I would love to quote is the um, Ocean Innovators Platform that the foundation launched last year to put together on a round table entrepreneurs, investment funds, banks, and philanthropists to share the existing technologies and solutions for marine life. We're not talking about startups at that level. We are promoting up and running companies that do generate jobs, do generate margins and profits, and have a positive impact on the ecosystems. This can honestly become the triple win that we are seeking for to accelerate and to leverage and scale up these existing uh, uh, solutions to face all the challenges the planet has to face today. And the triple win would be jobs, positive impact on the environment, and profits. Let's talk the business language when we address marine conservation or online conservation. So behind each one of these initiatives that I could, again, I believe lies a, a conviction strongly hated by a person, Prince Albert II, but also the need to pull all, sorry for that, to pull all our talents and all our energy to address the many crises that we are facing. We need, of course, the invaluable expertise of scientists. We need the dynamism, the inventiveness, and resources of the private sector. We need their ability to meet the aspirations of the public and invent a new way of life. We need 
the mobilizing capacity of NGOs as well. And we also need public regulations alone capable of establishing the general interest which unites us with future generations. And above all, we need to encourage an exchange of views and approaches to create new solutions, to make mistakes sometimes, but also to try again and again to change the paradigm, to make the shift happen, the greener or bluer shift happen. So whether it's trying to move forward with the foundation our players in Monaco, in keeping with the tradition and the spirit of our principality and its princes when it comes to innovation. So this afternoon panels will be, um, will, will include great examples of that spirit that animates Monaco. So I thank you very much for attention and thank you for joining this great summit. Olivier, thank you, well spoken. And uh, it's really nice to have the opportunity to, uh, to hear from the government perspective and also how you're working with industry. Very nice examples. Next, we'll hear from Pascal Torres uh, on energy optimization solutions for buildings and industry, the age of hypervision. And Pascal has the, the pleasure of managing companies both in this area and in Monaco. So a very unique perspective. Pascal, great to have you. Thanks, Tom, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your um, uh, for being here. And I'm very uh, pleased to to present Inoleo. Inoleo is a company that uh, we have founded in 2008. Now it is an uh, SAM, and we are 21 uh, people. Mainly, all the people are involved in uh, R&D, but uh, few are dedicated, fully dedicated to to R&D. Our um, main sector is HVAC, and we can uh, deal with any buildings in the industry, laboratories, or tertiary uh, buildings. Uh, we have created uh, Enoleo in 2008, and we were the, the winner of the business creation, which is a kind of concours uh, in Monaco in 2007 because of our uh, uh, skills in energy saving. We are used to work uh, remotely. Uh, as you can see on the, on the map, we have a lot of industrial clients, mainly in the perfume and flavor industry because we are close to, to grass. And with those clients, we are working everywhere in the world. So that permits us to be uh, very efficient. So for example, uh, we are very happy now to, to, to have possibility, thanks to Monaco government, to be involved in European project. And uh, for us, it will be very easy to be involved in um, building some specific equipment, whatever the, the site in Europe or anywhere else. And we are used to uh, uh, conceive, to, 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 to design and to install and do commissioning and even also uh, after sales service everywhere in the world. What is very specific uh, for Enoleo is that usually when you are a HVAC company, you are not very good or don't have any skills in automation. When you, are, you have skill in automation, you are not very good in designing HVAC system. What is specific with Enoleo is that we have all those skills. So we are able to design, to manufacture, to install, to do the commissioning, and to do also the, the maintenance of all HVAC system, including complex system. So the first part of our skill is the, the engineering. So we are able within the team to do 3D drawings. We can also be involved in BIM, of course, because this is uh, uh, now very, very common. So we have uh, skills in uh, designing all the drawings and be included in the, in the BIM. We have also possibility to do simulation for uh, thermic application, for airflow, for hydraulic. Um, and also we are able to do prototyping, maybe uh, at a little scale or 100% or scale. And uh, we have also expertise in 3D printing to, to be faster and, uh, and cheaper in, uh, in prototyping 
whatever the, the system uh, we, are, we are designing. So as I explained, we, we can also uh, install the, the, the system uh, anywhere in the world. We are doing it regularly for our, our client. What we are doing is, of course, doing engineering, but also we do prefabrication. So in our factory, we have a partnership with a specific factory. We prefabricate all the elements in different uh, pieces, and we just have to combine them on site. So it's very easy. Uh, it's very cheap, also, of course, also. And that permits us to be, um, uh, to be efficient and to, to be uh, also cheaper uh, than uh, some of our uh, competitors in a specific uh, installation. So what can be interesting for you also in uh, European projects is that we are able to manufacture very specific, new and uh, complex systems. For example, you can see on the pictures uh, at the bottom, we are the first to have installed a um, cylindro-parabolic uh, solar panel on the roof of, on a, of a building. So it was for a little project, local project in uh, the west of France. And we have designed everything, the modelization, the simulation of the airflow, uh, the charge, the, 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 the how to, to, to put and to fix the, the system on the roof, what is the efficiency, and uh, how to mix this energy with the, the boiler, for, for example. So this is just an example to, to show you that we are uh, able and, of course, interested in designing very specific and complex system, HVAC system, especially for European projects uh, that can be very ambitious and uh, very interesting. So as I explained, we are specialists in automation, so we are able to uh, program not in any languages, but as you can see, uh, a lot of languages that we can uh, find in, uh, in buildings. So we are able to, to connect uh, to, those, uh, to those systems, to program, and we have also skills in developing software. So we have our own BMS, but we can also develop few systems, few software to, to, to create gateways, to create uh, API, to connect to other, uh, for example, uh, software. In the case, uh, we need to, 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 to put data together to, to do better analysis. And our last um, product is a combination of uh, all those skills. Uh, we call it hypervision. It is a tool that is uh, that permit, permits to have man predictive maintenance and to uh, to have uh, information uh, decision tool helper to to make improvement and to uh, identify the drifts and uh, what the system why the system is going wrong. So that permits to the operators, to the technical team in the building, to have a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, combined information to help them to, uh, to understand that something is wrong. Because when something is wrong, of course, a few days, few weeks after, it will be a failure. But between the failure and the time where the drift starts, there is a lot of energy consumption. And so we can have uh, very good um, actions for energy saving in detecting such, uh, such drifts and help people uh, to make the, the, the good decision and to act uh, uh, quickly on the, on the system. So thank you very much. And uh, as I said, we are very excited to, to work with you in uh, the next projects and uh, to, 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 give you, to give you our knowledge and to, to be involved in, uh, in the projects uh, in which we can, um, we, we can uh, work with you. Uh, so thank you, and we are available for any uh, information. Thank you, Pascal. And uh, having the pleasure to know Pascal, he's someone that is uh, really been hands-on and is doing internal R&D that is competitive with many of the topics we're working on and uh, expertise in industrial energy efficiency and buildings energy efficiency. So both of those uh, areas are, 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 are good candidates for working with them. Next up, it is my pleasure to introduce Frédéric Dalmaze. 
Doug Muzzi, thank you. Who is the CEO of AgriCorp, SAM. And yesterday we also heard from the National Contact Point there are some interesting calls coming up on Agri and renewables and PV. So I think it's a good opportunity to listen to, uh, to Frederic on the agro industry, a driver of sustainable development. Please, Frederic, pleasure to have you. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a really a great opportunity for, for us at AgriCorp to be able to meet with uh, all of you and to partner on those exciting projects. We are not in the world of uh, science and research regarding sustainability. However, we are lucky enough to operate on a large playground where some innovations and ideas could have a real impact. Like, for instance, this. Got that. Okay, so we are uh, an international uh, group. We, we actually are international not only for our locations, but because we do interact with a lot of nationalities. I am extremely lucky to interact with also a lot of cultures in different countries. And our core business model is around agriculture and agro-processing, agro-industrial industry. We are extremely committed to being compliant to ESG principles. We are going to, to look into that later. Um, we are headquartered in Monaco. So obviously, now you understand, thanks to the very good uh, presentation before, why being in Monaco is an advantage when you want to develop such activities everywhere in the world. We are a young company. We are 10 years. Uh, 10, we, we are set up in 2011, but we are part of a bigger group a bigger organization, Monaco Resources Group, uh, which has been established for quite a long time and with a strong presence in Africa and the world with logistics, infrastructure, uh, metals, and mining. This is a very con convenient uh, position in the group. Uh, we do have um, uh, employees everywhere, around a little bit less at 700, in the of on, on the offices, but also on the, on the factories and on the, on the fields. And we are organized in three business units. We are not extremely creative in terms of naming those business units. So we have agriculture, food processing, and vanilla and spices. In agriculture, what we do, and what everybody connected to this division, whether they be uh, uh, employees, clients, suppliers, are actually working on one goal. We need to stop importing crops, food, whether they are staple crops or prepared food, to Africa, to Asia, everywhere. We need to be able to work uh, in a way that we can develop programs, develop sustainably some crops that will prevent those imports to, to happen. Obviously, uh, they have a bad impact uh, on the environment, but the sustainable impact we, we, we want to have there is to involve also the local people, the local communities to work with us in order to ensure that we can share the best practices regarding agricultural practices, regarding sustainable practices on the use of fertilizers, for instance, on, for instance, the proper use of, uh, of mechanization. The idea also being in those places, because we are in Western Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa for this, uh, uh, for this activity, is to have the, the, the significant impact that is truly enabled by the size of the land bank under management. We do operate with a land bank of 130, 100,000 uh, hectares. It's quite significant, but this is how we operate and this is where we involve uh, uh, the, the local communities with us to make sure that we can also include uh, next to those, uh, to those uh, let's say, gardens, uh, what we call other farm holders or, or outgrowers. We develop our activities also with them in order to make them benefit from the value chain or the supply chain that we create. Last but not least on this division, we do consider sustain sustainable development to be truly enabled by technology, but by processing. And innovation is what enables us today 
to provide solutions for post-harvest warehouses, for instance, or logistic solutions. Of course, as I already said, we are significant, significantly helped by the strong logistic and infrastructure division of the group Monaco Resources Group in Africa, but also when we export in Europe. But we are still facing the same difficulties in Africa regarding water consumption, energy consumption. And this is why I'm looking forward for this division to have uh, many discussions with you at a later stage and understand what kind of innovation could be truly deployed where we operate. But more than that, we also need to implement uh, good practices in Africa regarding processing, and, and innovation will come from there. But in order to come with ideas, we need to have a center of excellence already. And in the division processing, we have a presence in Eastern Europe, in EU, in Sofia, but also in Northern Macedonia, where we have factories, canning units, uh, where there, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, activities regarding preparation of vegetables, mushrooms, and, 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 and a lot of prepared foods. But the idea, and what we do today, is to connect more the, the know-how of this place to the big playgrounds and opportunity to secure uh, uh, additional raw material from, from Africa. For that, we have been significantly helped and supported by uh, EU programs in order to maintain and calibrate the existing uh, processing uh, tools to the standards of more and more demanding uh, European cus uh, customers. The last division, Vanilla and Spices, is a division that we started from scratch in 2015 uh, with a local partner called Mathieu Lugar. The idea there was to understand how to have a stronger impact in a product that all of us know. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, all of you know about vanilla, have eaten vanilla in ice cream, and, 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 and those of you that are allergic to vanilla are forced to identify where there are vanilla in, in, some, in some products. But behind these products, there is a community, there is a galaxy of farm holders, and there is a culture. The innovation in the approach is that we need to preserve this, and to preserve this, it's no longer a supplier approach or customer approach. We need to work together to ensure that we are going to um, provide to the long-term consumers like you the best quality. And this is what will make those developments, those programs, but also everything around the communities uh, a, durable, uh, a durable activity. We do work closely with the local farm holders. We are also work working with uh, NGOs and we are extremely lucky to be part of Monaco because this is something which is strongly supported, encouraged in Monaco. So all of this, all of this is, is, is basically contributing to, to, uh, to a mission that, uh, that we are following at, uh, at AgriCorp. And I think it was already introduced, so I will be short on this one, but the idea today is to bring as close as possible the, the consumer to the producer, to eliminate intermediation that is not providing any added value and that cannot contribute to the durability of the, of the value chain we are, we are dealing with. This is the mission that we have, but this is also the DNA of every single member and, and uh, consultant, uh, client or supplier interacting with, with AgriCorp. But for us, because it was more than a mission, it was translated into a financial instrument. And actually, AgriCorp, AgriCorp is the first company to issue a sustainability bond for Africa. This is something that was uh, issued in 2021 delayed from 2020, you can imagine why, but it has been a very long preparation involving a lot of uh, people getting a lot of support. But this is the way we are going to be able to truly have an impact, to truly change 
by embracing those financial instruments which do have a significant, uh, let's say, importance for communicating on what we have, where we are, and uh, having the, 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 the clear KPIs to be monitored on a regular basis. So, again, as I said at the introduction, I'm very happy to be there. And the reason that we are here at AgriCorp is because one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that we think is important is around partnership. And with proper partnership, with proper ideas, we do believe that uh, we would be in a position where we operate to have an even stronger and an even faster impact. Thank you very much. What are the compliments on everything you're doing? Uh, Improving processes, financing, enabling sustainable places. I am inspired. I didn't know AgriCorp, and now I do, and thank you. Sam just got off the plane from Montreal. Just before the lunch, he grabbed the taxi, he arrived to be with us today. Tomorrow he's off to Zurich. So if, you know, it, let's create a picture. Think of Monaco, think of all the buildings. How can artificial intelligence start to drive Monaco in a better way? or any urban area, Nice. This is something and a challenge that Brainbox AI is working on on the global scale. Uh, I think it's 70 cities worldwide, a lot of learning, a lot of challenges, and a lot of success. So I think it's an, an amazing opportunity here. Sam, today, thank you for making the flight. Thanks for being with us, and you'll join us at the dinner tonight. You can't ask for more than that. So it's my pleasure to present Sam Ramadori, the CEO of Brainbox AI. Thank you, Sam, for being here. I'd like to try to admit that leaving Montreal to come to Nice was a huge sacrifice, but uh, it was a pretty easy decision. Um, like Bra Brainbox AI, as uh, Thomas mentioned, we've been at it uh, getting up to six years now, and uh, it's been quite the journey. Uh, anybody who's touched uh, artificial intelligence knows that it's... Uh, it's moving fast, it's a rapidly evolving field. Uh, the group of PhDs that are focused in that sector is still relatively small. Um, and so uh, you're, you're constantly hitting up against challenges with no one to call, but the team to figure it out. So uh, I, I present here today, but back in Montreal and now uh, quite global, are 145 of us uh, really pushing to make the application of autonomous artificial intelligence a reality. Uh, and in our case, in buildings, and more specifically in the heating and cooling of buildings, okay? Um, the way we see the world in terms of buildings, biggest or second or third biggest asset class in the world, we are here, we all know there are millions upon millions of buildings. And the reality is today, the vast majority of them um, have systems in them that are heating and cooling the building, but these systems, as well as the other systems that run the building, are internal, usually not connected to the outside world. They generate a huge amount of data, day in and day out, but the reality is that data is used for that moment to make that decision in that building, and then that data gets thrown away a few days later when the computer runs out of memory. Right? And, and rarely have I seen uh, an industry that generates so much data and then throws away so much data day in and day out. Um, the other element is that these heating and cooling systems in these buildings, we're in a building right now, we wish the air conditioner was going even stronger than it is now, but these buildings are constantly making decisions about how to heat and cool the insides of the buildings and typically only using the sensors in the buildings, the thermostat on the wall, the heat, uh, the humidity sensor, et cetera. And yet the biggest impact on the building is outside, is the weather, uh, inside occupancy, uh, where's the electricity coming from, how much does it cost? These systems are making decisions every day without that data. All they do, all they know is that sensor on the wall is saying this room is too hot, we need to cool it down doesn't know where the electricity is coming from, doesn't know how carbon intensive it is at this point in the day, et cetera. So you could just see the opportunity to bring, we like to say, to bring these buildings alive. 
Um, as a reminder, everyone in this room is here because they know it. Uh, bu buildings account for the, the largest amount of GHG emissions in the world. And, and the single biggest component within that, uh, those GHG emissions, some of it is new construction, some of it is other uh, energy use, but the single biggest component is the heating and cooling systems of buildings. Uh, and the way we view them for everything and the way we've just described them, to us, buildings are large, blind consumers of energy in the urban setting, right? They are, com they are completely blind to what's happening outside of its walls in terms of the pressure on that urban system to use energy as efficiently as possible for all the reasons it needs energy and to be flexible with the energy grid so that we can move more and more towards green energy, renewable energy. We need to start thinking about the flexibility of the users. We never had, certainly not in North America, I could tell you that. You turn on a switch, you put your clothes to dry at any time of the day, you don't even think about it. I know in Europe it's more, there's a lot more conscious effort around that. But still, even here, right, we don't even think. We turn on a switch, we expect the electricity to be there. Well, the world we're trying to get to is not going to be that simple. And so we need to think about how we make our energy users much more intelligent, much more flexible. Um, so in our case, why work on applying autonomous artificial intelligence? Um, it, was a heavy, it is a heavy lift. Uh, I think we all know a lot the, the, the amount of money being poured into making self-driving cars using autonomous artificial intelligence. It's still being worked on. It's very hard. Um, it's an emerging field, but the results are quite encouraging and it's exciting to be working uh, in this endeavor. And basically, as I mentioned, the whole idea is to take this industry that generates huge amounts of data every day, and instead of throwing it away, let's use it more intelligently. Um, and, and in our case, to bring these buildings alive and to make them smarter in their everyday, every minute decisions. So for us, that means taking the building of the, the data of the building, marrying it with the external factors. So detailed weather information, utility rate structures, the carbon intensity of that energy, uh, which changes throughout the day. Uh, and we keep adding more and more data as we go along to that, to that core data set. Um, and then really leverage that autonomous modulation. So as we know, this building here, probably walk around and count the individual components of the HVAC system. You might have a good guess, but it's not 20, right? It's probably 200. And in a bigger building, it would be 500 individual components. How do you optimize the decisions for each of those little components, taking into account that outside data? Well, autonomous AI allows you to do that. Whether it's 1,000 components, 5,000 components, Every minute of every day, it's relearning, reforecasting the future that it's facing, weather outside, occupancy, et cetera, et cetera, and deciding what the best uh, outcomes are or the best decisions for that little fan on the 10th floor, right? We can't do that economically using traditional methods, but autonomous AI allows you to do that. And then the next exciting evolution for us is taking everything I've spoken to you right now is about making a single building efficient. Right? taking this building, making it more efficient. What's really exciting is when you have 50 or 100 AI-enabled buildings in a city, in an urban setting, you can then have them behave together. Could you imagine this building here making a decision because the hotel four buildings down is going through a moment of more energy stress or making a decision that the, all the hotels on this stretch making a decision because right now it's cloudy or in the next three hours it's going to be cloudy. The wind's not blowing and therefore the renewable energy is at a low point. So should they be all be behaving together to try to reduce the load on the energy grid at the same time? Um, I mean, it sounds a bit futuristic, but that's what we're pushing. That's what we're getting at uh, now. So original focus was optimizing a single building. Next is optimizing a, a, a portfolio of buildings or a, a number of buildings in a certain urban setting to give the energy flexibility we need to go more and more green. Um, so I, I think many people in this room are working on that uh, transition from the traditional energy grid, one-way electricity from big coal or nuclear power facilities uh, and moving to a system that's much more interactive between the users of energy, residential homes, office buildings, industrial, et cetera, and have much more intelligence about how and when energy is being used and whether it can be traded, uh, et cetera, including local, uh, local generation of, of renewable energy. Uh, so for us, how we view it is taking a building, we, like we said, large energy consumer, largely blind, 
and making it more intelligent, making it part of the ecosystem and making it make decisions, not because that thermostat is saying something, but because the outside world is saying something and has a different need. So um, for us, uh, the other impact of, of AI is scalability. So the ability to apply using data. So we're not sending teams to buildings, but rather using the data in the building and outside building to make it more efficient. Uh, so it can largely be anywhere in the world. I think I'm up on time, right? Okay. Um, so uh, it's been quite the journey. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting presentations and meet a lot of interesting folks. This team here is working on I, I have to believe many, many incredible projects that we need, but um, that ability to, uh, to, to deploy globally and really make an impact means we've, we've been able to present in a number of venues uh, around the world and we really wanna keep pushing that. We're participating in our first Horizon European project, which is exciting for us. Um, also partnered with ABB who became an investor, um, but more importantly is using our technology in the field. So uh, thank you uh, for the time today. Look forward to any questions. Thank you, Sam. And just to make the connection, you mentioned the uh, shortage of PhDs. You mentioned global. Brainbox AI has just set up a, a research center in, uh, in Europe, in Ireland. So now they are fully able to participate with us. And I would anticipate that some PhDs from Europe will have the opportunity to work with this Canadian based company on European challenges and global challenges. So if that wasn't clear, I just wanted to point that out uh, to, to everyone. So that's excellent. I see myself just to make sure that we, uh, because it's a video, great. Excellent, so we're to our last speaker. We are on time. We have 15 minutes left. So we're gonna be just fine. And uh, I, I don't intend to embarrass anyone, but Valeria, Faranda from IES embarrassed me when she said this morning at 6 a.m. she finished 15 kilometer run on the Promenade d'Anglaise. So, you know, hats off to that. So if there's an award for the longest travel or to the longest run today, I think we have them uh, on this stage. But more importantly, then let me transition to the presentation. How digital twin technologies are being used as a tool to develop urban scale decarbonization roadmaps. So if we can use artificial intelligence to get all these buildings working together, how do we then tie that to digital twins and simulation tools so that we can retrofit better and certify better using database or data-driven uh, decisions and design? So this is what we'll hear from for Valeria. Thanks for joining us. Great to have you. So thanks, Tom, for the introduction. You just <laughs> be bad with me. Good. <laughs> Thanks again. So I'm going to present something about how digital twins can help decarbonizing cities and communities because, because we are here at sustainable places. So sustainable places should be every place in which we live and we spend time. So our buildings, our cities, our communities in general. So as IES, we have a vision. We want every building of every city in the world to be decarbonized, to be able to uh, to use to be energy efficient, to use as, as less as possible resources from the environment, and to be eliminating global reliance on fossil fuels and pushing very much as much as we can renewables, and while while still keeping comfort and health and well-being of the occupants and the citizens, who are the ones actually using the buildings and the cities themselves. So a couple of words about IES, very short, because I want to show you examples rather than speaking about like uh, uh, our company. Uh, so we are on the field since 28 years now. So we are home of the largest building physics analytics team in the world. And we are leading uh, the building performance uh, simulation uh, sector. So our technology, our simulation software has been used to design more than 1 million buildings worldwide. and. Uh, our technology actually helped saving, uh, uh, preventing 37 power stations to be built. And this is like how we want to have an impact of, on our world and our environment. So just another thing I want to mention about IES is the fact that we invest one fourth of our turnover in R&D. So majority of our tools are actually uh, coming. They are commercial tools, but they are coming from research projects. So we are really much, very much like involved in European research, in funded research, because we want, always want to get like uh, pushing new technologies and new like markets, explore new opportunities. Um, 
So, as I said, our technology was initially conceived and, and used for designing sustainable and energy efficient buildings. So it was used at the design stage and it was focused on single buildings. Then, like in time, we realized that decarbonization is a big challenge and cannot be tackled and achieved if we just look at one building at a time. We need to leverage on the scale opportunities. So we need to look at communities and how, for example, buildings interact one with each other and exchange resources. And also we would like to identify if there is any opportunity for large scale renovation. We want to enable renewable integration and match supply and demand between buildings. Uh, this is also always helping to the risk investments. And what our technology is about is making good decisions about this uh, type of approaches and how decision makers can like uh, understand how they can plan for zero carbon in the future. So just a couple of words on our concept of digital twin. So digital twin is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. So you will have heard about different types of digital twins. Basically our concept of a digital twin is a performance digital twin. So it couples the data that Sam has very well like explained and the fact that we are collecting loads of data from the site. But what differentiates us is our knowledge of the building physics. So basically we know the fundamental physics principles that uh, run, let's the, say the, the behavior of heat transfer and heat flow and energy within the building and with, between the building and the external environment. And this is the core of, core of our simulation technology. When we couple this with data from IoT sensors, from BMS systems, from any other data source, then what we can, we can achieve is a real digital twin. So it's a virtual replica of an asset which behaves exactly like the real counterpart. And we also use AI machine learning, but not as a key decision maker, rather as a, like an enabler for, for example, filling data gaps or check for anomalies or like do some predictions but it's always complementing our physics-based approach, uh, which makes uh, like, uh, our digital twin kind of unique. So basically, when you think about a digital twin, you have in mind a fancy 3D model, uh, like a beam model, for example. That's a, a type of a digital twin. That's a declination of it. But it's just a static snapshot in time. What we have is a dynamic thing that really behaves every moment in time like the real counterpart. And this is what, what makes it ideal for taking decisions and run scenarios and, and use it as a virtual test bed for uh, defining the carbonization road mapping, for example. Here, there are a few examples of how a digital twin can look like. So you can have a, a fancy 3D model with physics embedded, looking at spaces and rooms and uh, very detailed loads within the spaces. If you are looking at the city, then you have a slightly less detailed model, but still you have the 3D part plus the physics embedded in it. But you might also have a digital twin of a network where you, you see the combination of uh, the interaction between different buildings and our resources like uh, electricity, heat, heat, energy, cooling, water, waste are exchanged between the different buildings and the different assets within the network. So just moving to like our, to the topic basically. So how digital twins can help uh, large scale net zero road mapping. So basically you can use them as a test bed for comparing virtually different scenarios. Uh, you can use it for, for example, uh, test the impact of decarbonizing heating and cooling needs, for example, uh, looking at the impact on the grid, for example, looking at how you can uh, improve in your community renewable energy generation and storage, making sure that you have the less like uh, impact on the grid itself. You can look at uh, how you can integrate electric vehicles, for example, uh, managing the, 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 the demand as well and the charging uh, of them, and you can understand complex interactions between buildings and energy networks. And last but not least, you can use digital twins also to, co also to communicate your plans. So at city scale, this is very important because you want to engage your citizens, you want to understand and different stakeholders as well, not only citizens. You want to make them understand what's happening, why they should do certain actions, why certain things are pushed and there are incentives and investments in certain areas. So we have been working with huge number of cities uh, worldwide. Here is just a selection. I think it's over 50 overall, but here is just a selection. Most of them we work within our European projects. In other cases, it's just commercial work we are doing for them. And they are all based in Europe, but we are also doing a lot of work uh, worldwide uh, in Asia, for example, um, in which we work with smaller communities like campuses and, and, and uh, uh, smaller local communities. 
so I, I'm going to, to show you a few examples. So the first one is uh, how we can use a region level digital twin to test the carbonization option. This is a project that is ongoing. It's a public tender, so it's a commercial project we are doing for two public authorities in Scotland. Basically, it's a community including one, 150,000 uh, structures, so it's quite a big, uh, let's say, area. And it, I think it's the largest digital team we have been building so far. And we are using it to explore different decarbonization options and the goal of the project is to do a decarbonization roadmap towards 2045 so the council could implement the actions that we recommend to them so let me just show a small video here so uh, you will be you will see the digital twin moving now so it's an online a version of it which collects all the information that are available for the community and uh, you can navigate them uh, by uh, selecting different like uh, variables, different metrics to be shown. Uh, for example, here you have like uh, um, uh, efficiency of, uh, of boilers. You can you can see different colors. I mean, actually, my 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 face is hiding the legend. So if you could just remove it, it would be great from the screen. Um, so basically, you can explore different variables. This model also hosts all the simulations that we have done. So here, for example, if you click on a building, what you can see is like uh, different uh, metrics that were already available from different data sets, but then also different um, simula simulated data. For example, you, you have simulated heating energy, and you see if the boiler is very inefficient, the value is pretty high and the same for carbon emissions. But if you pick a building which is a bit newer, uh, then you can see that uh, the simulated uh, eating energy for the baseline is actually higher. So this could help you understand and identify where you could apply certain intervention. And what we can do is simulate scenarios at scale, which tackle only the buildings, for example, that are inefficient uh, to, to have specific retrofits. Or we can use the same model to spot areas for district eating opportunities, for example. So this is very flexible and only being able to even only being able to navigate this different information was really a very powerful for the councils and for the clients itself. Uh, a similar model has been used for this other example I'm going to show you, which is from the Warrington Borough. So the locality uh, is based in Northwest England. It's an area of 180 square kilometers. Uh, it's 90,000 bean structures and we built a digital twin similar the one that, that you've seen before, uh, starting from data that the council had plus EPCs and like we can use different type of data sets. Really, it's not, uh, it's very flexible. And we used uh, the digital twin to do a decarbonization roadmap for specific areas within this big, um, let's say, borough. Uh, here you can see some snapshots of the type of information you can visualize in the digital tweet. For example, you have building use on the bottom left, you have a roof insulation level, you, which you can uh, use to identify where to apply scale uh, retrofit interventions. You have like electric, electrical network data, for example, which buildings are connected to a specific substation. This helps you to understand where you can actually, if you can actually put, for example, renewables without disrupting the 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 the, let's say the, the grid, uh, the local grid. So we simulated on digital digital twin different approaches and different scenarios. First, we look at that energy demand and health of it, how we could make our buildings more efficient first. Second thing was to decarbonize it, so how we could uh, electrify um, uh, the buildings and what's the performance of this, what's the availability, what's the impact on the heat. For example, uh, uh, if we deliver it pump and deploy it pumps uh, on a large scale, what would be the impact? Then we look at that renewables again and looking at uh, using a digital twin for the network, we look at this and uh, if we needed storage, what type of storage, etc. And last but not least, electric vehicle charging points, what was the maximum EV deployment, what was the impact on grid? And then we assessed the total carbon emission reduction doing this set of interventions. So this is an example from 500 buildings within that area. Uh, so we have two scenarios, one with low retrofit and the other one is for full retrofit. And you can see actually the difference in carbon emissions is, uh, there is a difference, but not as big as we could expect. And with a low uh, level retrofit, the return on investment is actually 
pay the reasonable five years, so it's a good scenario. And what we did then, we created the full decarbonization roadmap. So this is the annual carbon for the uh, low retrofit scenario. And you can see we can achieve a reduction by 95% uh, in 2030, if we apply all this intervention in this sequence. Same, this is for the full retrofit scenario, but again, the difference is just 2%, so you can perhaps balance investment and the, the actual uh, carbon reduction that you want to achieve. So this shows how a digital twin can be used to take decisions, and this is informative for the, um, for the councils, for the public authorities, and for any even private stakeholders to understand how they could decarbonize their own um, their own portfolio. This is a comparison between the two cases, by the way. And then you can also display it as a dashboard, so something interactive in, in which you can see the decarbonization roadmap and people can play with it, can move it across and see the different areas interested from the specific intervention. And this is very good for engagement as well because you can show people, okay, this is the impact you are going to achieve if you do ABC. And for example, in private investment, this could push people to take some decisions and some actions as well. Then what you can do is, okay, we start from a city, we can then zoom in. And if we want to do specific analysis at building level, we can actually do detailed simulations and detailed digital twins at building level, which then goes into real details of the spaces, the rooms, the HVAC systems. And you can use these models to do a decarbonization roadmap at building level, which is way more detailed and provides you even operational actions. So this is a small like uh, interactive report in which you see like few digital twins and the actual and measured uh, electricity and gas consumption for the building. You see the difference is very small between the two, which means that the digital twin is actually behaving like the building in reality. So you can use it as a test bed for different interventions. Then what you can do, you can simulate different options. All of these options you can see on the left and the right. You can actually see the impact one by one because they were simulated on the digital twin. And what is shown here is that just the application of all the uh, solutions all together to see the final imp impact that can be achieved. And again, you can display it as a roadmap. Uh, I think this is very visual and very helpful, and it provides you a sort of zoom in from the city, for, from the urban scale to the single building. And then you can potentially go into spaces later on. So what's next now? So our, what we are working towards is actually trying to optimize and control individual buildings. So using the digital twin, not only for like simulating scenarios, but also to feedback these scenarios to the building systems. And this is something for the near future, I would say we are working on it. And the idea is to have this intelligent building controller, which could use the digital twin and the model and the data coming from the site as well. So for example, occupancy level, weather data, or any, uh, different information from the sensors to actually run simulations which are run daily and you can actually understand how the, your building is uh, operated and how should be better operated and give recommendations to the facility manager, for example. Same approach could be done at community center level. So you have different assets and you can optimize how the buildings interact one to each other. So I think it's very similar to the approach that Sam uh, explained before. The difference is just that we are also using physics together with data. So we can somehow even estimate things that never happened before because we don't necessarily have to train an algorithm to do that. But I think it's very complementary and very like uh, spot on with the two of us in the same session. Um, and of course, the last bit would be intelligent community grid. So different communities being operated efficiently and run and optimized as best that optimized to work together. So this would enable really like a, the real smart city, uh, not just deploying sensors here and there, but just operating the, the different assets in the city in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way. So that's it for me. Thanks a lot. And we are perfectly on time, perfectly on time. We have a five minute transition to wrap up some themes. We started with climate challenges are very pressing, but there are solutions. And it's not just these solutions, this entire conference has exciting solutions. So how to implement them, how to get them to the market, how to work with government officials, 
how to improve processes, how to take decisions auto autonomously or with physics. Really interesting themes. And uh, although the times are challenging, there's some hope that maybe we can make some progress. We also, you know, my, my, my chat saying, if anyone didn't notice, we had the Monaco flag up here. And I think we have the Monaco NCP that joined this session. Do we have that individual in the room? Just the, okay, in the back, we have, you know, just to see the face, thanks for joining us. And if anyone is interested uh, to, to, to talk with this individual, uh, you know, we, we have that individual here. So now we have a five minute transition to the next workshops. Everybody's hoping that you join these workshops and uh, we'll see you tonight at the Nesco, Negresco as well. Please join me in thanking our panelist speakers for today's excellent plenary session.